Frank Kameny's love for the stars began early. When his grandmother gave him the Book of Knowledge, a World War I era children's encyclopedia, he read it cover to cover. The science sections fascinated him the most, so the four-year-old decided to become a scientist. By the age of six, he narrowed his chosen profession down to a specialty. He would become an astronomer, learning the secrets of the heavens. And so he did. He studied hard throughout his childhood and managed to get into Queens College for Physics nearby Richmond Hill, where he grew up. His undergraduate program was interrupted by the draft, and Kameny served for three years before returning to finish his degree, after which he continued his education in the Harvard Astronomy PhD program under the mentorship of renowned astronomer Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin. One of these years, he spent in Tucson, working at Stewart Observatory. After begrudgingly dealing with Boston winters, Kameny attended a conference in Flagstaff and visited the University of Arizona while in the state. And, I mean, what's not to love about Tucson? During his year there, Frank used the Stewart Telescope and continued his research, but he also found community. See, Frank was gay, and when he befriended a fellow gay student at Stewart Observatory, he was introduced to the queer community, living quietly but vibrantly in the desert city. Frank thrived during his year in Tucson, working on his PhD thesis and dating a man named Keith. Frank and Keith drove to the middle of the desert a few miles north of Tucson, and on a warm night, they lay under a clear sky, a full moon. It was, as Kameny observed with Keith in his arms, perfect. How could something so beautiful, so objectively full of joy, be any less natural, any less right than the infinite stars above him? It wouldn't last, though. In August of 1956, after an astronomy conference in San Francisco, Frank was arrested for lewd conduct and loitering after being caught with another man. While told that if he pled guilty, paid the fine, and completed the probation, his record would be adjusted to show not guilty, case dismissed. It was this case that haunted him several years later, when he was fired from his job at the Army Map Service for being homosexual, ending his astronomy career forever and making Frank an early victim of the Lavender Scare. You may have heard of a scare of another color from the post-World War II era. The Red Scare was a state-sanctioned system meant to purge the government of all suspected communist sympathizers. But the Lavender Scare was happening simultaneously, and it started with the same man. Senator Joseph McCarthy told the world that he and his team had discovered that there were what he dubbed card-carrying communists actively working in the State Department. 205, to be precise. Although, a few days later, that number changed to 57, when he was only counting what he considered to be serious threats. Then, a week later, 81, in a very overly detailed account of all these security risks. And among those 81 risks, McCarthy decided to call out two specific cases, both of groups of people rather than individuals. They had been flagged because they were thought to be homosexual. Instantly, in the public eye, communist was synonymous with homosexual. From there, it was chaos for the once thriving queer community in the State Department. Washington, D.C. in the 1930s and 40s hadn't been perfect for queer people. Folks were still arrested if found out in public with someone of the same sex, but you could still keep a job and a home if you were careful. Suddenly, though, if you were queer, going into work at the office was a terrifying experience. Anything and everything out of the ordinary was enough to get a coworker to call in about you. Oh, you and your friend, both men, shared some beers after work at your apartment? Interesting. You're a woman, and you've taken to wearing pants more than skirts and dresses? Peculiar. And once you were reported, it was only a matter of time before you were called in for a very invasive interview. The morals investigators looked at everything. School records, employment records, past residencies, known friends and associates, common hangouts, hobbies, what they called unusual traits of speech, appearance, or personality, whatever that means. They would even make contact with police departments in areas where the staff member may have been ticketed or arrested for something like a traffic stop or disorderly conduct, just to see if those were code for being caught being gay in public. If the investigators were able to get you to confess, you were fired, or just not hired in the first place. It wasn't because you were gay, though, or so they claimed. Being gay was the condition, it was the symptoms of it that got you fired. As the CIA director of the time, Roscoe Hillencotter, explained, there were 13 reasons that homosexuals should not be trusted, including that they experience emotions, quote, as strong and in fact actually stronger than heterosexual ones, that they have psychopathic tendencies that affect their judgment, that they are vulnerable to seduction from foreign adversaries, and that they are particularly susceptible to blackmail due to their promiscuous nature, just to name a few. This all made queer people unfit to hold a security clearance in the government, 
And I don't think I have to tell you that all of this is a load of hot garbage. But that's exactly how countless State Department employees were fired from their jobs. After which some couldn't find new employment and lost homes, families, and their lives. The Lavender Scare began in the State Department, but quickly spread to other parts of the government. While NASA hadn't been formed yet, astronomers were already being employed at places like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena or the Army Map Service and, as evidenced by Frank Kameny's firing, were also suffering the consequences of this awful policy. NASA formed in 1958, and four years later, it received a new administrator. His name was James Webb. One doesn't simply walk into NASA one day and become administrator, of course. Before taking on this role, Webb had over a decade of political positions under his belt, including serving as Undersecretary of State in 1947. In this role, Webb would act as substitute for the actual Secretary of State when they were abroad, which ended up being for about half the year, thus making sure there was someone to do the Secretary of State job at all times. In covering for both jobs, Webb was involved with a lot of things in the State Department. And he happened to be in this position at the same time all the elements of the Lavender Scare were being created. Specifically, we have proof that he was around for two meetings that were important in dictating how the Lavender Scare played out. The first was a meeting after a speech gone wrong from Webb's Deputy Undersecretary of State, John Purifoy. The speech originally had nothing to do with the department's policies on queer employees, but Purifoy was led into questions that revealed that there were holes in the way the State Department was purging their employees. Namely, because there was no big database on who was gay in the government, those in the early days of the Lavender Scare were able to find work in other government agencies after being fired. The Democratic-led State Department didn't want the Republicans to keep poking at their failings, so they changed the policy to remove a person's security clearance if they were found out to be homosexual, as well as firing them, so they would have practically no chance at ever working a government job again. This led to a meeting between Truman and Webb on June 22, 1950, regarding the Hoey Committee, a group made up of Congressman Hoey, Murphy, and Springarn, and how Webb and the committee could, quote, work together on the homosexual investigation. Later, on June 28th, Webb met with the committee and was tasked with, quote, limiting Congress's ability to use the threat of failure of this program to increase its insight and oversight of the State Department. Basically, Webb was supposed to make sure the Republicans in Congress didn't hear too much about the Lavender Scare firings. We don't know what Webb did to accomplish this, if anything. It isn't written down anywhere. But I want to make it clear that no one was trying to help queer people in this. The Democrats were trying to hide their actions from their Republican counterparts to save their own asses. Every time a queer person was fired, it was seen as a failing on the State Department. Because how could they have been so stupid as to have hired a homosexual in the first place? These were the two instances that Webb was directly involved in the Lavender Scare. At least the only two we have on paper. We also know he was given a copy of Carlisle Humasign's Memorandum on Homosexuality, in which was the outline of how the State Department wanted to treat the, quote, problem of homosexuals and sex perverts in the Department of the State. It's your usual stuff. There are security risks, they should be investigated and fired quickly. You know the drill by now. But that's the sum of Webb's involvement in the Lavender Scare during his time in the State Department, at least from what could be found. He left in 1952, and then on Valentine's Day in 1961, he began his time as the NASA Administrator. Webb joined NASA at the beginning of the space race, and spent his seven years as administrator lobbying for support in Congress, and he was able to get it. He was a politician, and he was pretty good. Webb also made sure money was going to programs other than just human spaceflight, including things like Mariner and the Pioneer missions. He also initiated diversity programs and equal employment opportunities, supporting the Civil Rights Act and specifically targeting black schools for recruitment efforts. This allowed NASA to go from the government agency with the worst amount of black representation to the best by the time he left. Those numbers don't automatically translate to equality for these black workers, especially the black women working for NASA, but it was a start. I'm not gonna say everything Webb did was awful. He was good at his job. He got money for NASA and was able to allocate it in ways that gave scientists the tools they needed to get us to the moon. He also took responsibility for the Apollo 1 disaster, stepping down from his position after that to take the blame away from NASA as a whole and ensure that funding would still come in for the space program. But he was also in charge when NASA astronomer Clifford J. Norton was arrested in 1963 for a traffic violation after being spied on flirting with another man. Norton was fired, of course, but he appealed the decision and it was reviewed by the Civil Service Appeals Examiner and the Board of Appeals and Review. Both upheld the firing, 
It took until 1969, but Norton finally had his case appear in court and managed to win his appeal, becoming the first victim of the Lavender Scare to do so. In the NASA Historian Report reviewing Webb's involvement in all this, Chief Historian Brian C. Odom states, The actions against Norton was, as mentioned by his boss, Robert F. Garabini, custom within the agency at the time he was fired. Norton was far from the only one who this happened to during the period of 1961 to 1968 when Webb was administrator, which then leads to the often confusing question of, if someone is in charge, how much are they to blame for what happens to those they're responsible for? It's the product of the times argument, really. It was the 1950s and 60s. No one was advocating for the rights of queer people in the government, so why would Webb? But there were people advocating for queer rights at this time, one of them being Frank Kameny. After being denied his dream of becoming an astronomer, Frank Kameny refused to accept the prejudice his firing was based on. He fought to get his case tried in a real courtroom rather than by a couple of morals officers in a hidden away office. In his case with the U.S. Civil Service Commission, Frank argued that he deserved his job and his security clearance, arguing his case not by claiming he wasn't gay, but that he was, and there was nothing wrong with that. While he was unsuccessful, this was the first U.S. court case regarding a civil rights violation on the basis of sexual orientation, which paved the way for others like Norton to fight and, eventually, win. Frank wasn't just arguing on his own behalf, though. He helped establish a group called the Mattachine Society of Washington, inspired by the Mattachine Society of San Francisco. The Society of Queer Men and Women published a newsletter, provided the local queer community with legal assistance, and picketed for their rights in the nation's capital. Frank and Mattachine even spearheaded a campaign to overturn the sodomy laws in DC in 1963, and the bill that eventually succeeded in 1993 was drafted by Frank himself. He coined the term, gay is good, a powerful phrase in the queer rights movement that said, yes, we're queer, and not only is there nothing wrong with that, but it's wonderful. This all predates Stonewall in 1969, the night a queer bar was raided and the patrons finally decided they had had enough. Led by trans women of color like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, that is the night that many in the queer community today see as the beginning of the queer rights movement. And while it was a huge turning point, it couldn't have happened without the work done before by people like Frank. Frank even went on to run for Congress in the first election for a non-voting delegate to represent Washington, D.C. in the House of Representatives making him the first openly gay man to run for a congressional position. He didn't win, but he knew the chances were slim going in. Frank's main reasons for wanting to run was to show the queer community had power and deserved more of it. Kameny's candidacy would inspire other gay citizens to join the movement and seek power for themselves. Frank lived to be 86, and despite the progress made in his time, much of which he was involved in, he never took another job in astronomy. He had positions on and off that were data or computer related, but he was even let go from some of those when lavender scare practices spread to private companies. However, from everything I've read, it seems he led a fulfilling life despite not living his dream, surrounded by a beautiful queer community who loved and supported one another through it all. He passed away on October 11th, 2011, but not before imparting his experiences and a massive collection of archived materials from the time of the lavender scare to David K. Johnson. Johnson then went on to write, This book, which is an incredibly important historical record for this whole period of history, and coined the actual term, the Lavender Scare. Now, that was a really long story, but it was necessary to address the question of should the James Webb Space Telescope be named the James Webb Space Telescope? It's been a question in the general public since around 2015, but was brought back into the limelight when a small group of astronomers wrote an article in Scientific American about the controversial naming choice. Chandra Prescott Weinstein, Sarah Tuttle, Lucianne Walkowitz, and Brian Nord wrote, Webb might have played a positive role at NASA, but his greater legacy beyond the agency is also relevant. Now that we know of Webb's silence at state and his actions at NASA, we think it is time to rename JWST. This sparked a complicated debate in the astronomy community and caught the attention of NASA, who then had chief historian Dr. Odom do a deep dive into what exactly Webb's connections were to the lavender scare. According to NASA, they don't believe the name should change because, based on their research, he didn't have any real impact on the Lavender Scare. The group who originally wrote the article still holds their opinion strong, and the scientific community seems split by the issue. Some have continued to just call it the James Webb Space Telescope, or Webb, but others have decided to only refer to it as JWST. Whether that's for brevity or for their opinion on the issue is a personal question for everyone, 
but for me at least, besides this video, I try to stick with JWST. This whole situation is complicated and nuanced, and that means my conclusion is going to be too, so I hope that's okay. But I don't really think James Webb deserves the biggest, most revolutionary telescope of my lifetime so far to be named after him. And yes, part of that is because I hold a bit of my own bias. I mean, I'm queer myself. Can you blame me if I don't really vibe with the people who hurt my community? And maybe James Webb didn't do that directly, but he let it happen while in charge. He was able to help the black community by hiring more black scientists, even though racism and segregation was still rampant, which is amazing, but why couldn't he do that for queer people too? But besides all that, Webb wasn't a scientist. He was a politician. He was good at his job, like really good, got a bunch of money for NASA and used his skills well, but couldn't we have just named a building after him or something? We've named lots of telescopes after scientists, like the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, the Hubble Space Telescope, or the Chandra X-ray Observatory, but there's plenty more who haven't been recognized. Science isn't a monolith as it once was, or seemed like, and there aren't really figures like Kepler or Galileo or even Hubble that stand alone, or more realistically stand at the front of a crowd of astronomers and scientists who help them get there. Maybe we just start doing the acronym thing? The GMT, the VLA, you can even get creative with things like Sophia and SALT. Or just name them after what they do or where they are. The Green Bank Telescope, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Or we can do the astronomer staple and name them super literally, like the VLT, otherwise known as the Very Large Telescope. No matter what I say though, it seems like the telescope is still going to be JWST. And that's a little frustrating to me and to others I've talked to, but it did provide me one good thing. Diving into the controversy and history of all this has led me to learn so much more about the queer community and its extensive and brave history. It got me to read about Frank and all the others who were involved in the fight for equality like the Mattachine Societies and the Homophile Movement and just so, so many others. It's a community I'm incredibly proud to be a part of and I'm glad I got to share a bit of its history with you today. This video couldn't have been possible without the amazing resources I used to learn more about the Lavender Scare and Frank, including The Lavender Scare by David K. Johnson and The Deviant's War by Eric Cervini. I am so, so grateful that these wonderful scholars took the time to preserve all this history and I would absolutely recommend reading both if you're interested in learning more about Frank, The Lavender Scare, and the history of queer rights.